Hey, what's up, everybody? And I want to welcome everyone to episode two of the Improv Life, Fernando's Improv Blog Podcast. And today I have a very special guest, one of my absolute favorite people in the whole world, and I'm very biased, and I'm sure everyone who knows me knows it, and I'm sure he knows it. Uh, but let's give it up for one of the coolest dudes in the universe, the one, the only, Liam motherfucking Omani. Uh, not Omahani. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Liam Omani. How you doing, Liam? Liam Omani, yes. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm doing well. Thank you so much. All right. What an intro. <laughs> hey, you know, I really love you. Has your name been... I love you, too. Because, like, every time I talk to people, it was... O'Mahoney, that's what I wanted to say. Everyone calls, everyone calls you, oh, Liam O'Mahoney. And I was like, he's not the guy from Police Academy. <laughs> Mahoney! <laughs> yeah, um, it gets butchered a lot, yeah. And people, for some reason, think that O'Mahoney is the right way all the time. They're like, no, it's O'Mahoney. It's definitely O'Mahoney. And I think that they think I'm joking sometimes, but I'm like, it's O'Mahoney. And they're like, ah And uh, Do people tell you you're wrong on how you pronounce your last name? Yeah, a little bit. They're like, no, it's O'Mahoney. And then, like, if I were to say something, they'd be like, it's O'Mahoney. He's just messing with you. <laughs> What's funny is you're someone who's either very serious, not stoic, but just kind of like straight man. Or if you're doing a bit, it's obvious. So I, I could see you being a straight man about your name. Like, no, it's O'Mahoney. And that's what I mean, like, <laughs> Joker. <laughs> yeah, right, 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 right. What is that? Was, is that? Is that Irish? It is, yeah. It's Irish. Oh, because O'Mahoney. And you've been to Ireland a bunch, right? Yeah, I've been twice. I went uh, not this last September, but the September before, so two years ago. How was it going and visiting that like part of your history? It was cool. It's beautiful there, and it's it was the first time I went uh, was with my grandpa, and we stayed for two weeks in the same town where he grew up. We we went to like Kilkenny for a day. Um, we stayed at a family's friend's house in Passage East, and then we were like going into town which is Waterford right there where they make the Waterford crystal. And it was cool to see, he had to go there to like get some banking thing figured out. There was some issue with his Irish bank account that he couldn't access. We had to fly out and then he was like, my two cousins, my two, uh, what is that to him? My two grandsons come with, come with me and on this, this uh, visit home. And uh, it was cool. It was cool. We just like, Went to a lot of bars and drank a lot of beer and met a lot of his friends and they were all doing the same, betting on horses. That sounds cool. It was it like a rite of passage kind of, or like, I don't know, like something like that? Yeah, I guess it kind of felt like that. You know, I had never been and my dad always told stories about how he was like 16 and he stayed in Dunmore for the summer and, you know, was on his own. And I guess he used to go to Ireland a lot. So it was something that was like, um, do you know oh my god i was thinking do as well <laughs> i was thinking do and then you said do i forgot you and i have an amazing group mind we're linked we're linked we are all right everyone who doesn't know this if you know this you're like oh those i have probably done more scenes with liam than anybody else not that i'm ah. planning on that it doesn't like intention it just happened uh yeah and i feel some of the best scenes we've had just because we like sync up I don't know. It must be like musicians must have that when like everyone just syncs up on the same rhythm or the same groove or whatever. But yeah, yeah. It's a magical feeling because sometimes you'll be doing improv with someone and you're like, all right, this is the move that I think would come next. <laughs> and then someone throws you a curveball and you're like, fuck, <laughs> all right, I don't know what to do. Yeah, yeah. Nothing that's wrong because that's also improv, but it's not right, right. like, oh, okay, we both see it going in this direction. Totally. Yeah, it happens a lot and it's a really great feeling. It's, yeah, sometimes you 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 come with your bucket of water, and someone's like, says something, and you just you lose your the bucket's gone. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so tell me, how did we meet, Liam? I want to hear the story of how we met from your perspective. Okay. Yeah. Um, I remember I was doing a lot of short form improv shows with the Improv Collective, um, and we would always meet at Jeff's house for rehearsal before. We meet like an hour, or not like three hours before a show. We had long rehearsals before shows. Um, which was cool. And so one day they were like, oh, Fernando's back in town. He's going to be in the show tonight. And I was like, who's this guy? And I had maybe been doing improv for less than a year, definitely, maybe only six months. But uh, they were like, oh, yeah, he's coming back. He's, he's back. He's going to be in the show, you know? And uh, 
So I was like, cool, you know, anybody, like, I didn't, I was like, great, whoever that is. And so I remember we met and you're wearing that red button up shirt. That's kind of like, um, like a plaidish. No, it's like yeah, a, that was, like it, a gingham, like a red gingham. It used to be like my show shirt. I was like, this is the shirt I wear for shows. Love it. Love it. I wish I had a show shirt. Um, <laughs> like you have that, I feel like you have that show flannel or that show jacket. Right, right, right. Corduroy. It's like a, it's like a navy blue, almost like medium purple corduroy that you would wear. Yeah. <laughs> I have like a, a green sweater that I probably wore for an entire year. Yeah. And, and to most shows. Yeah. Most shows and practices and all that. Um, so I guess I do have an improv sweater, improv shirt. <laughs> um, so we, we were warming up, we were doing rehearsals and I remember we were in a scene where we were, we were minors somewhere. <laughs> And it got crazy. I always loved to, to take it crazy. At the beginning, that was my favorite thing. I was, and, and I look back on it now and laugh because it, I just wanted to like explore these, like I wanted to be an astronaut on another planet or like if we're digging, if we're miners, then we just struck, struck it rich, you know? We got that opal. And I don't know what happened in the scene, but I remember um, I remember you reminded me of it later and you were like, whoa, this guy did something crazy. And uh, this is probably like years later. And I was like, I remember that. It was weird. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we did the show. It was cool. Uh, my first impressions, I felt like you were like pretty serious and you came to like, you, you were there to, to get your uh, at bat, you know, you were there to, to swing your shot. That doesn't make sense. Uh, but it does, it does. I know what you mean though. And, and then from there on out, you were around and very ambitious. I remember it, that's, that was something that I really gravitate, gravitated towards because I feel like back then there was no like improv collective house teams. So, and this is all OC improv talk. So um, you were like, I'm gonna do my own sh solo show. And I was like, I wanna be a part of that. Or, and you know what, what it was? I think uh, you wanted to do a sketch show. And I had never even seen that at the Improv Collective, but there was like improv and like art nights and some stand up sometimes. But a sketch show, I was like, whoa, that sounds really cool. I'd love to be a part of that. And then you did your own solo show, the Fernando show, which was great. And you my so kick in. <laughs> I got to, I was the Andy Richter to your Conan O'Brien. Oh I, I was Andy Richter and the Roots. You I got, are, to play, I got to play some guitar. That's very uh, complimentary to me, I guess. Because I everything, I got man. nothing on Questlove. Well, I, I remember my first impressions of you. I heard about you actually before I met you as well. Or was like Liam, ha, huh. okay, Liam, he's fucking crazy, or something like that. <laughs> Liam, he's so random, like, like, because you're you're a very unique individual, and your improv play style is very free. So I think they had a tough time categorizing you or what your style was. So it's just like, <laughs> Liam, he's a wild one, <laughs> you know? So yeah. I, I mean, yeah, I mean, cool, cause you know, just from watching you that first, so what happens is I heard about you a lot and like, I was like, all right, but it wasn't like I was, I was like, all right, I was just like, all right, it's on my radar now, whatever. <laughs> he did that scene and you came out with so much information it was, <laughs> oh, and we're going to mine diamonds and plutonium and uranium ore, and then we're all going to get it. We're going to put it, like, in a trailer, and we're going to ship off to Mars. And in Mars, we're going to start a new colony and <laughs> replant humanity there, some shit like that. And I was like, I couldn't know what to do, because I was like, oh, well, he has it all. Well, I'm not going to fuck it. But I, I, was, I was impressed, because it wasn't railroading. It wasn't like, fuck you, I'm funnier. It's just more like you literally were in the moment just loving it. Yeah, yeah. A lot, there's a lot of word vomit. It just like, oh, also it's the future and this laser gun exists. Yeah, yeah, that's, that sounds about right. I used to come out a lot and do like just weird characters. Like, I, like whatever, if someone was doing the dishes, you know, I'd be like a little troll or something. I don't know. Dude, you've killed it so many times with so many weird characters. I feel like most people that when you're doing improv, I think you get sucked into it or you unlock a part of yourself that you're not using all the time. But that's what makes you so fun to play with, because you're just like, I don't know, you just get really into it. I don't know. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, you know, and just back then, I don't know, I was in a weird place, if I'm going to be honest with you. <laughs> I was in a weird place. And you were like one of the few people who didn't judge the fuck out of me. 
for whatever reason. I felt I was very judged <laughs> back then. Whereas if you didn't judge me, and you were just down to do shit. You were just down to, like, do whatever. You're like, yeah, let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. Even if it was a stupid idea, you're like, yeah, okay, let's do it. <laughs> I was always down. Yeah, totally. Well, I mean, did, looking back at that stuff, though, I feel like I learned a lot from all those, like, because we had some home runs. We had some wins. We also had some losses. But I feel like all those things taught me a lot. Like, the Fernando show, at the moment, was a failure. And it still is. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> It was an exercise in failure. <laughs> it was fun putting it together. It was fun learning all those things. It was fun learning all that stuff. It's just like it didn't click in the way that I wanted it to. But it's better to fail. Like, it, it, it's better, like, to fail big than, like, to never try at all, I guess. What do you think? I totally agree with that. Yeah. You miss 100% of the shots you don't take, you know? <laughs> and, um it was definitely something that I learned a lot from. Absolutely. You know, and I feel like in back then, whatever, it was like five years ago, not that long. Really five years ago? Longer. Maybe longer. But um, it was longer, I think. Maybe like five years. Let's say five years. I, w I just remember like you were like, I'm going to get my own show. I'm going to have my own spot that night. And, you know, a month in advance, we were, were rehearsing. And I was like, that's so fucking cool. He like, I, that wasn't happening as much now, you know, the guys, at the improv collective, I don't, I can't say that I do this or I'm good at this, but you know, you can pitch shows to people. I feel like, and it's, you, you can, you get your chance and it's, and it was really cool to see that grow and to be, you know, like it, it showed me what it took to bring all these people together, which is not an easy thing to do. You know, I remember, um, I stepped on my my guitar cable and my guitar got plugged out oh. and I was just scrambling on the ground for like, you know when you touch the cable it's like bzz, 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 bzz. and it was just yeah. <laughs> I remember a quote from that you said from that night you improvised a line that I'll never forget you said cuz I think it was like not the audience wasn't responding well and you're like hey sometimes you got to just jump off the cliff to see where you land and I thought <laughs> that was hilarious and uh, yeah, I carry some of that with me now, you know, sometimes you just got to jump off the cliff. Well, dude, uh, you're right, man. Um, it's funny, man. Now that I've done a lot more shows in LA and it's like, fuck, I'm glad I had those failures in Orange County. Cause that way when you go to LA where you do have some higher stakes shows or they seem higher stakes for whatever reason. Like, oh, I already, I already have this kind of like stage skin that I've developed where I don't have to yeah. work. Or it's not as important. Not that, not that shows aren't, not, aren't as important, but I think sometimes you get in your head like, this is the most important show of my life, even if it's probably not. But putting that much pressure on the show to be successful is almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy of it failing because you set some impossible standard that... Right, 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 right. It's like Christmas morning when you go to bed on Christmas Eve and you're so excited for Christmas. It's going to be the greatest day ever. This is uh, me speaking personally, maybe... A lot of people don't relate to this, but um, you're so excited. I remember laying in my bed, like anxious, shaking, like it's got to be the greatest. And then whatever. Yeah. Like you get like a Game Boy and it's great, but like the, your expectations are so much greater than, <laughs> you know, like you could have been given the moon and it would have been like, oh man. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Yeah. Uh... Uh, we did all that crazy shit back then. We did that lip sync battle or whatever that was with. Uh, P oh Yeah. Pierre uh, and Antoine, and uh, yeah, I think that that was really good. I enjoyed doing that a lot. Yeah, that was fun, man. Uh, the sketch shows, which is funny, no one fucking came to the sketch shows. <laughs> we worked our asses off. But you know what? Looking back, they were pretty good sketch shows. They were pretty good sketch shows, and, like, it's funny. That was, like, the pre-Big Selfie thing because it involved you – and uh Teresa and Sam and you know so like yeah totally you know we all bonded there like because you know uh, just so everyone knows uh Liam and I are a team called Big Selfie we've performed since the quarantine but Big Selfie's been around for like three four years now but Big Selfie wasn't like it wasn't an intentional thing it just kind of like happened organically which I feel in improv is a word that we use a lot organic and depending where you <laughs> have negative or positive connotations i'm kind of in the middle i guess but for me when something develops organically like at least like a group it's because the people in it like each other so much that it just seems like a natural combination 
as opposed to being like forced together and being like, we're here because we have ambition that makes us like be professional or something. Do you kind of know what I mean? Totally. Yeah, absolutely. I, I remember doing, it was a, the sketch show was called Hardeen and we did two shows and then we were going to do like uh, that were pure sketch and then we were going to do like a variety style show and we were practicing the Armando and stuff fell through with the show like day of and I, I did, did the show get canceled did we not perform I think we've went through with it huh because and we were missing a person well all right here's what happened we did three sketch shows and then uh, the third sketch show was probably our best one content wise but as a producer yeah there's a lot of mistakes in it so I think after that everyone involved like Leo and Ethan I was like you know let's just be done with it and then I'll do another one, but I just, I wasn't a good producer back then. So it, it didn't come out. I think, um, oh yeah. So I think what happens is the Armando started coming into vogue for a, a lot of us. So like uh, Brittany Brown had that show she wanted to do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Where that girl, I forgot her name, fucking bailed an hour before the show or something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, that's like, uh, cause it was, it was part of sketch show. And then we did that Armando where we called that guy in Sweden like it was oh, like yeah. 8 a.m. or something <laughs> and Leo had it like on a speaker and uh, the guy spoke not a lot of English but he didn't get there to be serious so he kept talking about vampires <laughs> oh yeah yeah <laughs> yeah so then uh, it was fun though we had fun and then um I had like a slot for some reason and I think I wanted to do a show with uh, Ethan and Leo again they're like yeah they're like you know what? we're gonna sit this one out we're good I was like, well, I have the slot. I'm just fucking hit up people I want to work with. And I hit, hit you up, obviously. And um, hit up Teresa. And I was like, who else could hit up? I'll hit up Sam, Sam Frosto. I was like, but who else? I'm, I'm at Specs now because I had joined Specs. It's like, oh, okay. I'll get uh, John Combs and I'll get Brandon Thresher and I'll get uh, Dustin Willoughby. Yeah. And, and I was like, whatever. You know, these are my friends. And <laughs> what's so cool is we had those rehearsals. You know, I just realized how special it was these three people were strangers on this side and these three people were strangers were here. One thing connecting me, the only connect connecting everybody was me. And then everyone just kind of became friends. I don't want to say instantly, but like over time, it was kind of a weird phenomenon. Yeah, no, that it was a really special uh, thing that happened with that, how we all came together because I'm, I love John Combs and Dustin Willoughby and Brandon Thresher. Um, there are amazing people and we wouldn't have ever met them unless we did had that one time to do a show and you know you never know what is going to come out of it but a lot of uh cool friendships did and great opportunities after that and it, it was it, looking back on it you know at the time it's just like yeah we're gonna do the show together but now it's like you know a seed that you planted then you're like maybe this maybe i'll get tomatoes and we got a fuckload of tomatoes. <laughs> I love that analogy. You're right. We got, we got a fucking fuckload of tomatoes. We did a ton of shows. I, don't, I think still that's the team I've done the most shows with. Maybe Easily. Yeah, maybe from probably that's kind of close. But no, because I feel like there was at least one or two months before like once a week or something. Or there were seasons where there was two shows a month. There was a lot of that stuff. And, uh, you know, I feel like we were just like a jam band slash just a show team. Because we practiced – we didn't practice with a coach for a while. We just kind of played with each other. We were a very unorthodox team. Totally. Now that I think about it, it was very based on chemistry and friendship, which I don't know is like the best model in the long run. But at the same time, like, I feel like at least we were trying to be free with each other and honest with each other. Definitely. Uh, yeah, it was fun. Man. Some of the best shows, dude. I don't know. There's like a million different big selfie things that I can think of. And I've written about it ad nauseum in my blog, Fernando's Improv blog, wordpress.com. I'll, I'll share some in, 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 the, in the link below. Yes, yes. But, dude, it, it's funny because you've become really good friends with someone like Brandon, right? Like, like you guys have collaborated on other projects together as well, right? Yeah, yeah. We've done uh, some short films together and I worked uh, with him, uh, worked for him and uh, like ran sound for his production studios, live broadcast production studio and... Um, he's just the greatest. I love him and his whole family. And he's uh, been so open to giving people opportunities to do creative things. And I really appreciate that. You know, it's hard to 
find people that want to make things and follow through with it. And he's Mr. Do it, you know, and that's been one of the greatest things or probably the greatest thing about doing improv is the people that you meet, the connections you make and, and, you know, you meet people and you gravitate towards people that uh, you love and you guys create things together, you know, outside of improv, you know, I met, you mentioned the, um, uh, the lip sync show and, you know, that was with Pierre and Antoine and we were in a band for like a whole year. And that was, an amazing experience to um that came out of improv oh yeah you guys met and improv you guys were a good band too man the shows you guys did <laughs> thank you <laughs> that was a lot of fun you guys had like a, uh not to put you in a box but like kind of like an avant-garde art house vibe but you were good musicians though because i feel like sometimes you'll watch a band that puts too much emphasis on the like presentation with the music's like eh, you know yeah uh, yeah uh, similar to a note Ricardo Feliciano said last week about improv shows. Uh, with, with you guys, you guys had the look, but you also backed it up with the, with the talent. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, I felt like I was the most, um, the least capable of the bunch. Um, but it was great because I've been like in and out of playing guitar. And since then, it's like a huge part of my life. And if I could play now, I would be way better than I was then. But yeah, it was just a super fun thing to be a part of, you know, to like explore these creative um, avenues. Have you, uh, have you always been a creative person? Like, like what brought you to improv? Cause I feel like a lot of, in LA, cause that's where most of my kind of life is now is, I feel like a lot of comedians I meet, they're like hardcore fans of comedy. You know, or they're actors who maybe a, a comedian is one of their biggest influences. But I've never known you to be like a huge comedy fan. Am I right or am I wrong? Or what's the truth? I I love comedy. Um, I love, I mean, I grew up with, uh, you know, all the Robin Williams films. Jim Carrey was somebody that I would like emulate and try and be, you know, I would watch The Mask and then the next day I was like The Mask at school, you know. And it sure? wasn't... Yeah. <laughs> no, not like that. Not like never in class, but like on the playground, you know, I do like a little bit that I remembered from that. And this, I wasn't even aware that I was like into comedy, but I never really watched uh, a lot of stand up or anything like that. I, I didn't, I kind of had a vague idea of what improv was. And my girlfriend Ivy actually loves stand up. So uh, we watch stand up all the time now. And it's, it's hilarious. I love stand up. Eddie Izzard, Dressed to Kill. That's we watch class. it all the time. We, we, could, we, could, we could watch it once a week. <laughs> and um, so I, I recently have a bigger appreciation for that. But what led me to improv was being in school. And oh, you know what it was? Is I always wanted to be, when I was really young, I always wanted to be in a play. And I was like, I'm gonna be in a play one day. I really want to do that. And, and my actually, when I was even going further back, when I was really little, the first thing I ever wanted to do was be an actor or a director. I saw The Mummy with Brendan Fraser, and I was like, that's what I want to do. Everything about that movie. And um, you must have seen that at a, at a young age, and you must have been like a small child then. Whenever that came out, yeah, I might have been like five, five or six. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I was like, all right, well, then I want to be in a play. But I never really, like, pursued it heavily. I remember one time my parents took me to, like, an acting audition, and it was kind of a scam. And um, so and that was, like, the end of it. And so from then on, moving forward, um, I would tell people that I want to be a fireman or, like, a businessman and, um, you know, an entrepreneur. And, you know, I kind of, like, followed that train of thought for a really long time. And I always loved music. I was... Played, played guitar since I was like nine. And so there's like a little bit of, you know, creative flow there, but like in middle school and high school, not really. And I got to the end of high school and I wasn't going away to college and I was gonna go to community college. And um, a lot of my friends moved away. And uh, I realized that some of my friends, some of the people that I surrounded myself with, I like didn't want to be around them. I, there weren't good people, you know, not the people that I wanted to be. And I'm not talking badly on, anyone specific, but like that was my overall feeling. And I was like, I need to do something different. So um, just like kind of slowly made friends that were more into 
uh, things that I was more interested in, like film and music. And I remember some some of these friends, um, we tried to make a band, it didn't really work out. We just like weren't, we just couldn't really play. But we have like movie nights and just like a great time. I loved being around these people. And so I'm going to school and I'm like, what am I gonna do? I changed my major like four times in two years. And I think my second to last semester, I was really feeling down on myself about not having um, like a clear path of uh, that I could like work towards, you know? And I was like doing graphic design and I was like, oh, I hate being on the computer all day. And uh, the, the different little things. And I saw so at OCC, they offered um, an improvisation class and, I, and it was in the theater department. And I was also determined to try out for the school play that year because I had gotten to this point where I was, I was just sick of not doing what I wanted to do and felt um, creative freedom from surrounding myself with these great new people, new-ish people. And um, so I was like, I'm gonna go for it. I'm gonna, I, what, do, what do I have to lose? You know, I'm taking these classes, I'm getting all bad grades. <laughs> and dude, I would not show up to class. I wouldn't. I would like not have an like, not have an essay the day it's due, and then just never go to the class again. And you were going um, through the motions. You were going through the motions for whatever reason, but your heart. Yeah. Totally, totally. So uh, I took the class, and um, I enrolled in the class. And then on like the first day of school was uh, auditions for a play. I forget what play it was, but um, it might have been like. I don't remember. I don't remember. So uh, I go in and I find out that you have to like enroll in the theater class and it has to be like at a, it's at a certain time. Um, and I don't even know if it was conflicting with my schedule, but I, uh, uh, my school schedule, but I looked in the room and I filled this paperwork and uh, we're, you're going to do a cold read. And I was like, <laughs> cold read? What the fuck is that? And uh so I peeked into the room and there was just people like getting it, like doing it, you know? And uh, I was like, okay, uh, cool. I panicked and I left, I got out of there. I was like, I'm gonna go to my car and get a pen and home, went straight home. And um, yeah, I just wasn't ready. I just saw it and I was so intimidated. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't do it and um, then the improv class started and I think Ben and Jeff have joked that in like the first two months of the class that they didn't even know I was in the class because I was really just like observing everything. And there's a lot of theater people. It's like uh, the closest I've been to, um, probably the closest I've been to that large amount of theater people. And I love theater people. They're so fun and outgoing. I mean, not everybody, but like, you know, they, they have, they have I, not in a bad way, but like, you know, you could still love a theater performer that was in your head. You didn't tell me, but you're like, you. and then you what? That's me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, such a lovable guy. Well, not everybody. I was like, who is that person? <laughs> that. Well, not everybody. I just paused for a second and. and... Oh, right. side note. Everyone, all right, just, just we'll go back on this. I have. Yeah, when I met Liam, I always had beef with people. So Liam was like, you have beef with somebody? And Liam <laughs> is anti-beef. I mean, you don't eat meat at all, too, right? But I mean, as Liam's cool with everyone, well, I was like, oh, I have beef with that person. I don't know. It, it's, it's a stupid thing. I was, <laughs> I, was, I was still maturing a lot back then. They're like, you have beef? You guys got beef? And I was like, eh, it's stupid, petty, improv, political battles that don't matter anything. But no, it's, it's funny. So you were in... Ben's class, Ben when he taught the class, and uh, Jeff Ambers was his TA back then. Yep. Uh, Jeff, along with Rob Souders, are the founders of the Improv Collective. So it was kind of like a farm system, that class, in a way. Um, yeah. So, like, you were there for two months. How was it with those first two months? Was that your first time in a theater class ever? It was. You know, in seventh grade, we had a drama class at my middle school, and um, it was an elective, and they did these lip syncs every year. They would, like, perform for the school, these lip syncs, and um, in sixth grade, the first time I was home, I was like, I want that elective, and I always put it down, and I never got it, because you, ha you had to, like, pick three, and then you got, like, one of them. Um, I always got woodshop, and, or, like, computers, and... So I was like, okay, well, I never made, I don't even think our school had plays. Maybe they did. I don't know. But, uh, so that was my first time in a uh, theater class. Wow. And what a, like, 
what a theater class to be a part of because I think theater is intimidating. I remember I have a similar story to you. I remember when I was like 18, I went to OCC as well and I was going to do rep and I went to the rep class every week for like the whole semester and I would just sit in the back. What is that? What's rep? Uh, the the OCC theater repertory. It's like the student. Oh, okay. Okay. And for like a semester, I would just sit back there like this with my arms off fucking, <laughs> I was like a hundred pounds lighter though and just like try to act cool when I was like fucking the most scared person there. <laughs> I didn't do anything. I literally Isn't didn't. that funny? When, when you're like the most scared, scared you, you put up the wall? Yeah. Well, I put up the wall. I did like one audition because I was like, oh, it was a big shot in my high school theater program. <laughs> uh, now I'm nobody. And actually, I, I had to go work on myself before I came back. But I can understand the like, just being intimidated by people who are in love with theater, you know, who are just in love. Yeah. That is intimidating. Totally. Yeah. And, uh, who have been doing it for their entire lives. I had neighbors, I had gone to their place. They were doing like uh, um, uh, like independent theater plays in third grade. You know, it was like a part of their mom, like put them in it and they had to do it. And uh, I saw Oklahoma and Fiddler on the Roof and it was cool, but it wasn't like immediately me being, I want to do that so bad. And uh so yeah, being in the class for the first time was really cool. You know, there's uh, it was a big class, a lot of people I'm still in contact with, like really, really close contact with. Um, and to see people get up and give it a shot and to like, you had to uh, raise your hand, like who wants to be in this scene, you know, and you got chosen. So you had to show the initiative that you wanted to participate. And I was like, I was just kind of like, not arms crossed, but like, mm -hmm, I'm just watching. <laughs> I, just, I just want to get a feel. I want to read the room before I jump up there. And uh, it was so much fun. That's, that's what, why I stuck with it is just because of how much fun it was. It was what I'd always been looking for, a piece of what I've always been looking for, you know, and it really opened the door for me in so many ways. Well, I'm glad, for me. I'm glad you did it because I already met you and I already had such an amazing friend um Thank however you. i can agree with the like i don't want to say i'm not trying to talk shit on that class or, or or the way it was run or the improv collective or anything like that uh but i think the culture back then even now uh, i'm not trying to talk shit i'm just trying to be honest here it was very much like well you better prove that you want to do this you know it's like you better prove you want to do improv it's almost like joining a gang oh yeah you want to do improv you better prove it. <laughs> <laughs> which to, to be fair, I think the positive is, though, is you filter out all the people who are like, yeah, I'm going to do it. And then they never show up or they have things or they never deliver. So, am I, you know, in a way, you are doing your organization a favor by being like, hey, if you want to be here, you better fucking prove it. Because, you, you know, do is show up. You just got to be there, be on time, show up. And, you know, like the more you do it, the, the better you get, you know, or like the more you understand it. Maybe, you know, it's just. Not that I'm great at all, but as a performer, but it's something that, you know, you learn over time. When I look back and I'm like, oh, I, I was Mr. Crazy Town. And now I'm uh, Mr. Crazy Town hyphen, not always, hopefully. <laughs> I feel like you're some like, uh, you're like some punk man who like slowly uh, uh, move towards like art rock, you know, because you're like... <laughs> No, because you've gone, I know, because I know you've, you've had, a, you've had, a, I trained you a little bit, I, I think I can say that, but you've actually gone. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, you've actually gone to UCB, and you've actually gone through the entire program, so you had all this, like. I, I never finished the program. Oh, what level did you get to? I did level three, and then I never did level four. But you were, like, in a serious, like, team, like, an indie team for a while, though, right? Yeah, yeah, I was on a team, um. I guess we're still a team. We're just not able to perform, but... Um... Well, quick question, quick question. Because I think what I like about you, Liam, is that you're like, all right, I want to go get more training now. What was, what was the, like, impulse that said, I have to go take a class at UCB now or a class in LA in general? What, what was the reason behind that? You know, I didn't even, I had never even heard of UCB until around the time we did the lip sync show and people after or not, it was uh, during the rehearsals for that show. And someone was like talking about going to take classes in LA and it was 
Groundlings, Second City, like UC UCB was being thrown around a lot. And I was like, what are they talking about? This is just like a place, this is like Bin's class at OCC, but in LA, so it's better. And, you know, it, it, someone was like, oh, I'll take the class if you do. And what really actually motivated me to do it was uh, Samantha Watson, who was on It's an Improv. She's performed with the collective for a super long time, great person. And I don't know if she's still doing improv, uh, but she's hilarious. And she was like, hey, do you want to take the UCB class? Because she was a part of the lip sync show. And she's like, I want to take the UCB class. And it'd be cool to have someone to take it with and like carpool with. And I was like, yeah, uh, I'm down. You know, kind of going in blind, not really uh, knowing what to expect or like the level in of which UCB is treated, you know, there it's like. So you had no idea, you had no idea about the UCB reputation or mythology or lore. You're just like, Hey, let's do it. Never heard of it. And then I, so I started looking it up and like, so the classes were so expensive and I, I was so broke back then. I still am broke, but, um, it was a lot to take. It was like $400 wow. for uh, an eight week class and I had to buy a book. And then there was like a DVD, a live DVD of uh, an ASCAT performance, UCB ASCAT performance. And it was like with Tom Lennon and- um, I, had that, I, had, I had that DVD, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, I bought that and I watched that and I was, I died, it's hilarious. And um, so after that, I was a little bit like, whoa, this is actually pretty serious. This is like big time. I felt like it was like big time. And um, so I was definitely nervous. And my first teacher, I can't remember her name. She was great. Um, and yeah, so I only did to level three and then level four, I just didn't have the money and it fell through. But so uh, yeah, Sam was the one that um, got me to do it. You know, I couldn't have done it without her and I'm sure she would have done it without me. But it was really, really, great experience because I met a more great amazing people that I was on teams with for a long time I feel like you're someone who you make I don't want to say fast friends because I think fast friends I feel people say fast friends it means like friends of convenience I feel like you make genuine connections with people because you're doing the things you love with people who are doing what they love as well so I'm not surprised you've made tons of friends for this and that's great that's more reason people could <laughs> love here's the question I'm interested though how was it going from like being kind of like a big fish in a little pond kind of at the collective, which I can relate as well. And the kind of like, you know, training we had in there. I felt like the Ben's class was very much like, almost felt like a, like a wrestling training, you know, cause it was always, the training was always emphasis on getting you ready to perform, right? Uh, which I think is good. I think, I believe you should perform as an improviser. This is one of my things. Not everyone has to do it, but that's the reason I do it. How was it going from, like Orange County to going again this like regimented training up in LA from like this prestigious institution. How was that? You're right. It's definitely more um, regimented. And it was, you know, coming from Improv Collective, we were very loose. You know, we had, um, you know, they had been taught his own style, you know, uh, Crow which I did, can't remember what stands for. But uh, Character, relationship, objective, where? which I think may be a comedy sports thing or an improv thing. And now it's core if you do improv with oh. the character, objective, relationship, environment. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I think that's what it is. I could be wrong, though. Sorry. That just sounds to totally right. It actually sounds like the same exact thing, just different letters, you know. Where, <laughs> environment. That's on the back of the book. The same exact <laughs> thing, just with different letters. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so it was weird going to um, – classes that were so um they were teaching you know, a specific type of improv you know they, they teach um like game and um there's a word for it that i'm forgetting right now but it, it is really fun and it's really funny and, and i think that if it's done um well it's hilarious um but it was weird because it was like i have my um you know, bookcase over here of what I've learned. And then they, they were like, oh, but there's this one too. And, I, and it just kind of, I was like, oh, like that's when I learned that there was different forms of improv. And I wasn't really doing a lot of long form then. And the long form at the collective was very narrative. So um, that is where I was coming from. But quick side note, you taught Kiefer, Kiefer Langner and I, 
uh, the Herald like a year before this happened. And it was going to be a two man Herald team. And that is so crazy ambitious, even now thinking about it, but you taught us to Herald for like a whole year. We met up like once a week and uh, it never really clicked for me. And I, and I was like, okay, like uh, group games. And I remember we would like study 30 rock. You were showing us um, pieces of always sunny and really were a great teacher and a helpful um, insight to th this other form. But I was like, I don't know, really, I don't get it. And so when I went there, I had what you had said in the back of my mind. And I was like, that's exact, they're teaching it the exact way. And I, and I don't know, I think because it's like when I played guitar when I was nine, I was like never that good and like would try and practice and learn stuff. But then when I picked it back up when I was 18, it, it was like, oh, it's, uh, you know, I'm, you're riding the bike, you're getting this double analogy, you're getting back on the wheels. And um, so I had that in the back of my mind. And I was like, okay, like, I feel like I caught up quick. Um, and it felt really serious. So they have the inner sanctum and your shows down there, you got to see this many shows within the eight weeks of the course. And it was really, really cool. It felt serious. You know, it felt like people actually do this. And it is a livelihood for people and you know i was just realizing how much more and more i loved like not necessarily theater because i haven't like read or seen a bunch of plays but like the spectacle you know like entertainment the show the performance and um yeah after that it was like i feel like off and running i feel like when i was trying to teach you guys the two-man herald that was when i was like one of my like worst curmudgeon phases because I had just come back from San Francisco, which was like very like cosmopolitan and open and doing very a lot of game type stuff. And then in Orange County, it was still very like short for me, crow based stuff, very narrative. Uh, so I was kind of like bucking the trends by trying to do game stuff, but you and Kiefer were open to it. It's funny. Cause I, rem I remember I would get really advanced with all these things. And I think you and Kiefer <laughs> maybe kind of got it. And then I think if you did things correctly, it was just out of luck, but I didn't realize that I was just planting all the seeds that later on would just be like sprout when you're at UCB and someone probably who knew it better than I did explained it in a much more simplified fashion. It was another tomato. You know, what's funny. You become a great game player, you know, like I feel that when I'm playing with you, I feel yeah. that like, I feel that you and I switch a lot between pitcher and catcher, like, one of us will have an initiation and then like the other person knows exactly what you want them to do. You know, like it's a, it's a weird phenomenon. I've experienced it with few people, you know, and like now that I learned other types of improv, like, I don't know, um, some teachers be like, no, you could never assume anyone is, is, should, should know what you want them to do. And then I'm like, but then I was Liam a bunch. <laughs> you know? Or like, it always works with Fernando, so why would I do it different? No, no, which is fun. But you know what's cool? Because we do the monologue. We, we do the Armando. We do the monologue, and the audience is with us, too, though. The audience gets, oh, that's what they're doing. That's what's happening. Right, so right. That element that, like, we do it because we all want to be in agreement with each other. Um, but, yeah, you become a great game player you know are you aware of that i mean my opinion you know i know you're not some 20 year veteran but i think you're really fun to play with are you aware you. of more of a like game player what do you think um i don't think i'm great um but it has become my preferred form of improv you know um as opposed especially like the armando i love the storytelling aspect and then like getting to pick pick it apart and you know make this one detail a funny thing or so the, the, you know like how they told the story it's just what I was able to learn from UCB and from what I learned from being on the teams because when I was on the teams out there it was like way more serious we would hire coaches and um, have practice every single week and so it just became and like that's like the style I feel like in LA for the most part as 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 far as like UCB of course goes and but I would say most of improv, you know, it's like gamey, you know, which I feel like leads into sketch comedy. And well, writing. I will say that if you're going to do sketch comedy, you should definitely know game, regardless if you're an improviser or not. Everyone should take UCB's Improv Level 101 or just an equivalent somewhere. 
know about game or just go buy the book and read about it, watch sketches. Everyone needs to know about game. It's just, uh, I've been, th I've been th thinking about this all early. In sketch, it's always about like, you write the game in your head, you provide it by yourself. But like in an improv show with your team, you all discover it together. And then that's fun. That's what makes it fun. That's what, my, that's what makes it improvised. Sometimes a little higher than sketch highs, but you know, there's different things to compare them with. Now, now that yeah. I'm doing both more. How was it being on an indie team? Because, like, I don't think I've had experience. I've been on a pack house sketch team, which was fun. But I wasn't a good teammate because of a bunch of reasons. But how was it, man? Because, like, you, you can relate to this. A lot of L.A. people do not understand what Orange County people have to do to get to L.A. Because it's a commute, regardless. Even if you have amazing traffic, it's still a commute. How was it? Did you, like, plan out your days, like, when you were there? Like, what, like – how was yeah, that? So, for you? Um, I would definitely plan out my days. I would, you know, base my work availability on being able to perform or go to practices. And at this time, once I first, yeah, once I first started doing improv, I dropped out of school for like two years. And so I was working a lot, you know, sometimes I had three jobs and I always preferred to work in the mornings because for the most part shows are at night and you know, there could be a show, um on a tuesday at eight or you know or closer to midnight so yeah it became like my whole life kind of and the people on the teams were great i there was a time when i was on two teams overlapping and i would have back-to-back -back practices um in like different areas of la and it was like okay six to seven at this place and then we're doing seven thirty to well, it was two hour practices, however it works out, but it was like, boom, we're done. I got a split and I got another practice. And uh, that was so much fun. I just loved like the kind of, I like to be doing things, I guess. And so to be like, yeah, okay, we gotta go here. We're gonna do this and then go to the second practice. I always felt like the second practice was way better. That's where I would like, I was like, I'm way warmed up. Yeah, and I was like, Let's, I'm ready to go. Where are you guys at? Uh, no, everyone always showed up, but um it was a it was a lot when I think about it, especially now with the quarantine. Um, it's the longest I've not done improv in like seven years. Jesus Christ! This is your first improv sabbatical. Yeah, and I've considered taking a sabbatical um, in the past, but then there's also another side of me that's like, I'll probably never stop doing it. Just but, and I don't even think I'm like. If I'm being honest, I don't think I'm a great community member as far as like. Um, contributing to the growth of these theaters, these indie theaters. And uh, that's on me. I could be better. I could do better. I could do more. But I love them. I love, I will, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> but I, so I consider taking a pause, but um, it just kind of happened on its own well, all right. for all of us. Well, all right. I know what you mean. Maybe you're saying, I could be wrong if I'm wrong, that maybe you could go to more shows. Or maybe you can hang out more with whoever, you know, maybe like the veterans or the up and coming talent. I know what you mean. And there's, there is guilt there because like, I'm very invested here, but maybe I'm not committed in other stuff. But dude, you could, you do good improv shows. And like when you watch someone do a good improv show, like that inspires you, you know, I feel like all the comedians I see who've done improv is they all began as fans first, you know? And like a funny thing I've realized is like, I've seen so many amazing performers since I started doing improv that sometimes I don't feel like I have to go to like a real comedy show because I'm like, whoever I'm watching here is amazing, you know? And I'm witnessing something that's never happened again. So I know, I know that, that that's cool that you feel that way, but I feel like by you just doing shows and like sharing your gifts with everyone, like that's a lot. Like, <laughs> like don't underestimate that. That's not, that's yeah. not what it feels like the bare minimum, you know? It's like you get your slot and you'll do it. But at the beginning, I was there. I was would run tech and sweep the floors and take out the trash. And uh, it sounds bad, but now I'm like, I'm not gonna, well, there's other people to do it. I don't know. I sound like a bad person. No, 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 no. It's a, it's a generation thing. A new generation has to come in and do that work as well. Yeah, there is definitely waves of like people that come in and it's like, welcome, welcome. Yes, your guys are going to do this show. And, and you know, they, like you can see like, who has entered the collective and improv, you know, I'm just talking local OC because 
it's pretty tight knit. Um, you see like people come in, you know, and like, I don't want to say like they're the, they do the grunt work now, but um, I don't have to sweep the floors anymore, but I do feel guilty about that. It's like, I would still do it. I would, I'm not too good to sweep the floors, but. I have witnessed you sweep the floors many times when we were at the original improv collective space. Uh, the one that had the fucking pole and the <laughs> buzz that never went away. That buzz, that buzz, if you could hear the buzz, that means you were fucking bombing. <laughs> if you didn't hear it, people were laughing or you were in the moment. It's whenever that buzz of like, that's, <laughs> you knew you were bombing. Yeah. No, nah, man, I also feel though that, you know, just by doing good improv and, and showing the community what good improv looks like, that's a service as well. You know, like, I was, I guess trying to say is don't beat yourself up too much. Um, you, you know what's funny, man? I'm, I'm realizing you've had this journey. See, this I learned some new stuff today. I had no idea you always wanted to be an actor. That's all new to me. Maybe you told me before, but I don't know how serious it was. It seems like it seems like it was very serious for you when you were a kid, but something discouraged you. So you're like, oh, all right, I'm gonna go say I'm gonna be all these other things, but I don't really believe in that. But I'm gonna say it because people are asking me this question, and then I should give them an answer. Um, but it sounds like totally. you've had these turning points in your life where you're like, no, I want to do that. No, I want to do that. And by making those choices, it brought you closer to people who have helped you out just by being, by being a friend or unlocking new parts of you. But just by choosing those things you want to do, you're becoming more of who you, you want to be. What, what, does that make sense? What do you think? Absolutely. No, you're totally right. Um, yeah, I got to a point where I was just um, – you know, unhappy with what I was doing, what I was pursuing. And I remember maybe it was in class or something, a teacher said something, an adult was, I, they were like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I was like, oh, I want to be an actor and make movies and be a director. And they were like, ugh, good luck. <laughs> you know? not <laughs> and, and, you know, yeah, you're like 10 years old or something and you're just like, oh shit. Like, is it impossible? Is it like, uh, should I? You know, and, and like being confronted with that, I was like almost embarrassed that I had had this ambition. And so, you know, you don't want to be embarrassed. You say, you know, next time somebody asked me, I was like, I'm going to be a firefighter. And they're like, good on you. That's good. You know, give you a little shoulder hit. And, you know, and I'm just lying to myself. You know, it sounds bad. But I finally, I broke free of that. And, um have been so much happier ever since no no it's just because like we're nearing the end here that's why because you know it, i just realized like wow like a small choice you could have been somewhere like you could have made that like this is the right choice and i've done that in my life a lot this is what my community wants me to do this is what my family wants me to do whatever like i don't want to say sell out choices but it's when you're not, it's, it's, I think it's the choice when you don't choose yourself because you're trying to make someone else happy or please someone else. But I feel yeah. like you're, and, uh, I'm going to choose Liam. And I'm glad you chose yourself, man. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I mean, honestly, dude. And you know what? I'll tell you something. Embrace a sabbatical because you know what? All right, I, I to, am. I am. Embrace, how, how are you embracing it? Um, you know, at the beginning, it was like, it happened so um, suddenly, it's like, okay, my work's closed now, um, school's online, no more shows, you can barely go to a store. And um, it was a lot all at once for everybody, you know, and the, it, improv wasn't my first worry. I wasn't like, no, no, I won't be able to do improv. But it just, you know, it slowly sank in, you know, a month went by and I was like, man, this, I, this, that's already maybe the longest I haven't done improv. Um, in seven years. And I'm okay with it. You know, we'll be back. We're doing it. I've been able to work with um, you and some, a few other people um, because of Nicholas Yaka. We met over Zoom and we all pitched sketches and stuff like that. You know, we're, we're still, it's still happening. It's in the works. Obviously we can't do much, but there's, there's a lot to look forward to. And I've been pretty unmotivated, but to like do stuff creatively, but you know, I play my guitar every day and it's, it's, I've, a lot of things have slowed down. Like I said before, I like to be busy, busy, busy doing stuff. And so realizing that I can be con content, taking it a little slower is nice. You know, there's something um, kind of liberating about it. 
I will say the slowdown has made me realize how hard I was going. I think everybody, yeah. I think everybody in comedy made them realize how hard everyone, everyone was going because you fill up so many of your pockets of life of comedy. But embrace. I turned. Sorry, what were you saying? No, go for it. Go for it. What do you, you want to say? I was, I was just gonna say I've turned down job offers because they were unwilling to work with my schedule during when I wanted it to be made in a certain way that allowed me to practice and perform. Dude, I respect that so much. I'm serious, man. When you said that, I respect that so much. I remember when I used to work at <laughs> Disneyland. I'm serious, dude. I used to work at Disneyland, and I got on my first improv team, and I would work Friday nights consistently, and I would have to get the improv team to schedule me like a month in advance so I could put yeah. in the off request so that I could possibly make that show or have to work some fucking trade shift deal with someone. Right, right. You all just work to do like a 30 minute show if you're lucky. Or it's like an hour show, but your actual performance time is maybe 10 minutes. Yeah, right, right, right. And right. yeah, I've driven two hours for an eight minute spot. <laughs> oh my God. I'll uh, do it again. Yeah, one time me and Frankie Estrella, we drove fucking in a storm. We drove in a fucking storm to do five minutes at the clubhouse. Uh, and to be fair, we won the, like, cage match thing. We had the cool, like, champion. Oh, cool, cool. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, but it was just crazy. Like, Bristol and uh, 17th on my house was uh -huh. flooded. It was flooded. I don't know what me and Frankie were thinking, but when <laughs> you're an artist, a performer, the desire to do that overtakes you, and you'll do crazy shit. It's at midnight. It'll work at 6 a.m. Who gives a fuck? Yeah, whatever. <laughs> right totally yeah and it's crazy you think about it now and you're like like i said i would do it again but it's like man i really committed myself to and, and it's and it's an amazing thing to be committed to no it is well embrace the sabbatical lamb because i think you're giving your improv fields a time to rest and relax and then when you come back to it part of the reason i was so serious when you first met me was because I just came home from uh, from Brazil and Berkeley, and I hadn't done improv in, like, six months, and I missed it, and I was just miserable without it. So, like, maybe that's why I was so weird for that year or whatever, but you were a fucking instant friend. I guess what I'm trying to say is, like, sometimes the breaks, you need them. Whether you realize it or not, you read, like, you definitely need them, because I'm sure you're going to fucking kick ass once, once it comes again. Um, maybe I'll never go back. To do improv? Oh, no, no, I'm kidding. I don't know. I don't know. Those thoughts have crossed my mind, though. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. I feel like someone would call you, though. I feel like even if you, like, hit away, Leo, do you do an improv show? All right. <laughs> it's like John Wick. They're like, people keep asking me if I'm back. But I don't know the line. I just watched it movie the other night. But uh, he, he, he comes back from yeah. the sabbatical. Yeah. You should keep doing it, probably. I mean, you're very talented, man. You you are very funny. Like, thank you. Same to you, Fernando. You're hilarious. One of the most like ambitious and hardworking people that I know. Oh, thank you, brother. Thank you, man. And uh, what what is a final thought that you want to leave everybody with? A final thought. Um, I just want to give thanks to everybody in the community that's given me um, a place to perform, and um, everybody from. Specs, everybody from the Improv Collective, Ben for being my first teacher, Jeff for, you know, em embracing me into the community. And, you know, I just have so much love for everybody there. And I wish I could give them all a hug if they wanted one and thank them face to face. Um, yeah, I don't have any great advice. I just <laughs> want to- no, that's, that's a beautiful thing, man. some love, yeah. It's a beautiful thing, man. Well, everyone, Liam is sending you love. Please embrace it. He's a great hugger. He's a great guy to hug when you see him. And Liam, I want to thank you for coming on today. Uh, thank this, you so much for having me. Of course, man. We, we, I'm going to have you back. I don't know what we're talking about, but I'll have you back. <laughs> uh, this has been uh, episode two of the Improv Life, the Fernando's Improv blog podcast i want to thank you for listening please subscribe to the youtube channel and the spotify and other channels or whatever uh but thank you and good night Woo! Woo!